Thank you very much for the invitation to talk here at the Royal Society of Medicine. And a lot of what I will talk to you about will feed into what has been said earlier today. The topic being ventilation in the obese patient. Um, if I take you back maybe a decade, we all still were interested in this and heard about the, this being a hot topic maybe in the United States. And I remember in 2005 when I came over to London searching for patients with a BMI of 60, 70, 80 to actually study them in our physiology lab. Now, by now we have several patients on our books in the Lane Fox unit with a BMI above a 90, and last year we cracked the BMI of 100. So I will take this opportunity to start off with giving you an idea of the scale that we are talking about and why this is important and why, whether we want or not, this will affect all of us in our future care in the hospital. We're living in an age of non-communicable disease. If you pool all data from the WHO, from the member states that actually have data on this, then you will recognize that two-thirds of all worldwide deaths are attributable to non-communicable disease. And those are, in main parts, coming down to four factors. This is alcohol, nicotine, physical inactivity, and unhealthy diet. And well, you guess which ones, but you get the idea that some of them will contribute to obesity. So, if you look actually at the UK as a country, then already in 2008, and the numbers haven't changed a lot since then, but these are quite uh, impressive numbers, already in 2008 we had two-thirds of men either being overweight or obese, more than half of the women, Roughly a third of the population is actually obese, and roughly 2% of our population is morbidly obese, which is a BMI of 40 and beyond. Now, in a 60 million population, this is roughly 2%, 1.2 million, so we are talking about quite significant numbers. And although this is not a new issue, in former times, the acceptance of uh, this problem was not such. And with our lifestyle changing, that we commute on the train, we do not physically exercise, we have desktop-related jobs, and the always availability um, of high caloric food will lead to this becoming more and more of an issue for us. So independently of where we live, whether in a low, middle, or high-income country, actually the rates of childhood obesity are rising, and this is what will keep us busy over the next uh, couple of decades, I assume. What's less well known, though, it took in smoking and COPD uh, 50 years to accept the fact that you actually damage your health and you lose life years, but the same is true for obesity. Uh, this was already published in JMA in 2003, and depending on how obese you are, or whether you're uh, Caucasian or of other ethnic background, you lose, lose roughly um, up to a decade, or sometimes more, of your lifetime if you are morbidly obese. The obesity paradoxon is usually related to the observation that someone who's mildly obese BMI of 30 to 35 is rather uh, well off compared to someone with higher BMIs where you have a mortality curve which looks like a J or so. So this brings us to the respiratory system because the lung is quite a mechanical organ and um, or mechanistically uh, model and I want to introduce this very very simple um, uh, scheme to you which you probably in one way or the other have seen previously. Now, our central nervous system with the brain stem sends a signal to our body how to breathe, uh, particularly of importance, this is of course going down to the respiratory muscles, the strongest one being actually the diaphragm. Um, we can measure this signal with some indirect markers. In animals, we just put a needle electrode into the brainstem. In animals, we can't do that. So we have indirect markers here, one of the best that we currently have, actually, to measure neural respiratory drive from the diaphragm with a transesophageal electrode. 
Now, once the respiratory muscles receive that signal, they have to cope with a load on the respiratory muscles, and they have a certain capacity. And the theory being that if load matches capacity, um, and you can breathe with a reasonable amount of neural drive, then you are eugenic, you're without symptoms, and you maintain your uh, minute ventilation. If this, for some reason or the other, changes, load increases, capacity is reduced, and this is not compensated for by an appropriate response in neural respiratory drive, which can be maintained over time, then you go into, um, by daytime, into symptoms like dyspnea, if that uh, continues into respiratory failure, and by nighttime into sleep disorder breathing. Now, in obesity, for obvious reasons, the load on the respiratory system is increased. So what happens is the brain recruits more muscle function, more capacity to balance this. And this is possible by daytime. This is not possible if you are sedated or ventilated or by nighttime. And that's why patients with morbid obesity are prone and more likely to go into problems in these times. Now, this is more relevant to non-invasive ventilation and spontaneous breathing uh, subjects. But um, uh, to start off with that, uh, the most common sleep disorder, and it is uh, very frequent in obese subjects, is obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this year is from the original papers by Remus and Sauerland in the JAP from the late 70s, just before, a couple of years before uh, Sullivan invented uh, CPAP. Um, and what you have is at night time an occlusion of the upper airway with intermittent cessation of um, uh, flow. So you hold your breath and um, then uh, the body um, uh, arouses from sleep, uh, rebreathes. Here you have the rebreathing and then when you fall asleep again into deeper sleep, the whole uh, starts all over again. Um, the prevalence of sleep apnea was guesstimated in the early 90s. Uh, by the Wisconsin Sleep Group in Young at Alteras, published in New England Journal in the early 90s, of roughly being 4% of the middle-aged male population and 2% of the middle-aged female population. Now, the same group, Pepperell, um, uh, this time around, two decades on, this year, 2013, have published this in the American Journal of Epidemiology. Same group, same methodology, Wisconsin sleep cohort, and due to the rate of obesity, the prevalence rate of sleep apnea has increased in the US to 10% in the middle-aged male population. So this is something to consider because we are here in the UK slightly behind in the epidemiological developments around obesity, but this is something for anesthetist, for surgery, and for certainly the ventilated patient on the ICU, uh, something that will uh, need to be kept in mind if you want to wean them off the ventilator again. Now, a stage down, because not only the upper airway is a problem in obesity, um, the lower airway is similarly a problem. Uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome. So, in those patients, this relative mismatch of low to capacity ratio on the respiratory muscles um, seems to cause, particularly at night time, when your neural respiratory drive drops when you fall asleep and you cannot sustain uh, the level of effort that you uh, invest in, in, into the daytime breathing, then at night time you might have a patient who runs around by daytime with, with normal saturations, but then by night time desaturates here with an oxygen desaturation index of 177 per hour and a mean SpO2 of 70% and a mean CO2 level transcutaneously measured here, uh, hardly visible, sorry about that green trace, um, of 8.5 and, and a CO2 of maximal 10.5 kilopascal. So these are the patients that will cause a problem because if we um, do not consider what leads to these effects, then we won't actually ventilate them properly. So, it was a lot talk today about esophageal pressure measurement, and I'm very grateful because I quite enjoyed that talk, um, and about lung volumes and recruitment and posture.
What we have to be aware of in obese subjects, we don't know exactly why some develop restrictive failure and why others with the same BMI do not, but what seems to happen in morbid obesity is that the functional residual capacity of the individual patient seems to be much lower than in someone who is not obese. Whilst our FRC levels are quite significantly above the residual volume, we've studied over the last eight years or so a lot of patients in whom we see that the expiratory reserve volume, which is basically the level between FRC and residual volume, or the absolute level of FRC of obese patients is just above the residual volume <coughs> if you are morbidly or supramorbidly obese. So your lung is hypoinflated. And to keep in mind what happens in a normal subject when you change posture from seated to supine, is our FRC levels due to the change of the chest co configuration slightly drops by two, three, some groups have described 400 mils of, um, uh, of FRC. What happens in someone who is already in the seated posture breathing just above the level of residual volume and changes posture and the abdominal pressure impacts on the chest, well, they cannot breathe below residual volume, so um, they develop problems, atelectasis if you want so, um, but in particular if you measure their respiratory effort, they develop a threshold load that you need to overcome before inspiration starts. And that's what we've measured here, published in Thorax a couple of years ago. This is the trace from the esophageal pressure. And this here is flow. In a morbidly obese and otherwise healthy patient who was self-ventilating. He didn't have this phenomenon seated, but when he was lying down, you see this is here where the patient starts to breathe in, negative pressure, and then this is end expiration. And here again, the patient starts to breathe in, but he needs to overcome this delta before actually, because this is here where zero airflow is, and this is where inspiration starts, before he gets any value for money. So this is a positive end expiratory intrinsic pressure that the patient needs to overcome before any inspiratory airflow starts. And that is important to recognize because um, if we do not consider this when we ventilate the patients, then we have a problem, or the patient might have a problem. So if you measure in these patients also neural respiratory drives as, drive as a marker of what the brainstem is trying to send out to the muscles of how we should be breathing, then we studied 60 subjects in this uh, little physiological study with a BMI ranging from roughly 18 up to, what was it, 70 or so, the, the biggest one. And this is here how neural respiratory drive in terms of maximum activity of the diaphragm is when spontaneously breathing seated in these patients. And you see here if you are with a BMI between 20 and 30, then we know from larger uh, studies of our group, in this range you breathe, depending on your age, with whether you're awake or asleep, between maybe 5 and 12% of your maximum activity of, if you measure the diaphragm EMG. You see how this increases with the load that you put on the system. As your BMI increases, your percentage of maximum activity increases. And actually to a degree that if you t look at the group of someone with a BMI above 30, on average, roughly 20% of your maximum activity uh, is what you measure. And this is comparable to someone with moderately severe COPD or lung fibrosis. If you look at the, syn uh, the Sinded-B papers uh, and the method he uses that ended up eventually in developing NAVA. Um, so, but what happens in supine posture is uh, even more remarkable because the normal group of patients here, if you look at the group with the BMI of between 
2030 roughly, the drive doesn't really change. But the slope changes because the load in the obese patients goes up. So then you're suddenly talking in this group not about 20, but about 25% of your maximum drive that you need to um, invest into every breath that you take. And if you want to follow me through this slide, then you will maybe uh, see on the raw traces what is happening. So, so <coughs> sorry for this complicated picture, but the first line is actually the diaphragm EMG with ECG artifacts. And if you remember Dr. Ramsey's talk, you see here the EMG activity of someone seated, supine, and then here with CPA with a BMI of 42. The second line, similarly interesting, and I'll take you through both, is the esophageal <coughs> pressure. Spontaneously breathing seated, spontaneously breathing supine, and then spontaneously breathing supine with the CPA. And what you see is that neural respiratory drive as EMG from the diaphragm, from the crural part of the diaphragm, goes up. You might see this. Um, and then remarkably comes down with CPA in the supine posture. And why is that? Because if you look at the mechanics, then esophageal pressure swings go up remarkably. So this patient needs to increase his vocus breathing quite substantially. And here, you don't see it as, as well, but three slides ago I showed you the intrinsic peep. This is here to mark how much he actually needs to invest before he gets any inspiratory airflow. So in supine posture, these subjects need to work harder, they need to overcome an intrinsic peep, and this is here, I think, quite impressive, that difference. And then if you apply CPA, what Dr. Habashi mentioned, you inflate the chest. So the FRC being just above residual volume, think of the pressure volume curve and the unfavorable slope low down on the pressure volume curve, just above a, a residual volume. With CPAP, you inflate their chest and they breathe higher, maybe where you and me breathe, with an FRC somewhere uh, above a residual volume and, and not quite up at TLC just yet. Um, so, and this is what happens with the CPAP here. And you see, you offload their drive, they feel less breathless, you reduce their work of breathing, <coughs> and you overcome the intrinsic peak because there is actually a reactance instantly as you start to breathe in, uh, you get a response with an inspiratory airflow. So, this is what we should keep in mind and what I wanted to focus on, that in the obese patient, being self-ventilating or being non-invasively ventilated or be them on their uh, ventilator, invasively ventilated, we need to consider that the obesity impacts on the way the breathing should be actually monitored and treated. Obesity rates will increase and will impact on our everyday clinical practice. Um, we need to consider that the drive to breathe in those patients is quite high, so they might feel more breathless uh, with routine maneuvers. We have to consider the posture, with the supine posture being certainly the worst that we have. If you actually take an obese patient and you measure their drive to breathe and just tell them to sleep on the side instead of in supine posture, you sometimes see a response instantly of, of an in, uh, of a decrease in the EMG signal of 25% or so. So intrinsic PEEP is something that we have to have in mind. This is not because of a hyperinflated chest, like in COPD, that is because of a hypoinflated ch chest. And these patients breathe close to the closing volume of the airway because they're so hypoinflated. And we need to obviously overcome the huge abdominal pressures that push against the diaphragm when we start to breathe in. So in future, these factors will certainly need to be investigated even more so, because although we understand the mechanistical principle behind all this, we still do not know who with a high BMI will actually develop all these features and why someone with a BMI of 
a given 50, 60, might be hypercapnic and restrictive with their lung function, whilst another one with the similar features um, uh, might not. So future investigations should go into this direction, and we're currently trying to actually look into the abdominal pressures because I think there's a great deal to be said around that. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about from my point of view. Thank you very much.